show with two retired detectives that were in the thick of New York crime, fast and hectic. They got some stories and some jokes, even an interview with the most popular folks. Off the cuff, off the cuff, one episode just ain't enough. Get a little laughter in an interview too. It's maybe the best thing. To me, The Godfather 1 and 2 were the greatest movies ever made. Yeah. I think they were just fantastic. Yeah. And everyone has a favorite line uh, from The Godfather. And my, I'll tell you what mine is before I tell you. I loved when Salazzo is in the restaurant with Michael and Captain uh, McCluskey, and he says, hey, uh, you don't mind if we speak Italian, do you? And he goes, go ahead. And I I don't know why I love that line, because I, if I was a cop, I said, fuck, you know, you don't know. You speak English. I want to know what the hell you're saying. But I just yeah. love that line. You don't mind if we speak Italian. And meanwhile, yeah. Michael Corleone couldn't really speak good Italian either, because he started speaking English well, yeah, halfway through it. You see, he had to say that. He had to say that. That was yeah. written by Mario Puzzo, because the reason why he wrote that the first thing you would say is, well, why would they why would they talk like that in front of the cop? Even if he is his bodyguard, they would never do that. Ever. Right. So right. by them saying that, they, they were able to keep the cop at the table so he can be they can shoot him. But if he <laughs> said you had to leave or stand by the bar, then it would have been the same. Now you gotta shoot two people in different locations. That's so right. as a director, that's the reason why they said that line. Well, I he, love that line. <laughs> he gave him the courtesy. Listen, we're going to speak Italian now. He told him that was to keep him at bay, I guess. He was interested in the veal. And, uh, yeah, he said that. I don't give a shit. Do what he right, wants to do. Right, pay right. me. Best pay veal me. in the city. <laughs> yeah, try the veal. It's the best in the city. <laughs> How many times do people say that? Hey, try the veal. It's the best in the city. Oh, <laughs> on, on the job, when I was in the squad room, we used to say it every 10 minutes. I swear to God. <laughs> we would throw out lines from Godfather, Raging Bull, Goodfellas, all of that, you know. <laughs> And every time I'm walking down the street, somebody goes, hey, Chaz, throw me in the bathroom. Hey, Chaz, now you see yeah. right. <laughs> I got mushed. <laughs> I've been mushed. One of yeah. the things that the Bronx tale has, and very few movies get this, it has an iconic line oh, that yeah. will never, ever be forgotten. And, you know, it's like Clint Eastwood, go ahead, right. punk, make my day. Make you know, day. Arnold with hasta la vista, baby. I did security yeah. for Arnold Schwarzenegger in the city years ago. And people always say, I'll be back. You know, everyone's screaming out his lines, all the construction yeah. workers. But you have that amazing line, now you just can't leave. <laughs> yeah. In fact, I, like, if I, had my, I, I, I just have merchandise that just came out. I don't have it yet. Don't they see if you can get that thing? Yeah, I just put my merchandise out, and it says on these great hoodies I have made, now you just can't leave with a Bronx tail in the back. And it's That's fantastic. People just love that line. It's my biggest seller. They love that line. <laughs> well, like, because, you know, the, the bikers were such evil pricks, you know? Yeah, yeah. And it was like getting instant justice against them, you know? Yeah, but you, you, you know you know what I thought was so, like, great about that scene? That you were, you were going to give them the shot. Listen, guys, you know, maybe this ain't your place. You know, you better behave yourself. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then all of a sudden, they try to be wise asses. And right. they well, can't believe here it is right now. This is, uh, yeah, now you just can't leave. Right? <laughs> I love it. I love it. Tail on the back. Oh, That's excellent. And I, I got a whole bunch of merchandise, you know, uh, apparel. If anybody wants to get it, they can go to chaztomcherry.net. You know, Chaz, we have an expression uh, on the police department when a guy has like a really uh, good job and maybe doesn't deserve it. We say that guy's balls were dipped in butter. So we have that we have that on some of our uh, on some of our merchandise, you know, and, and people are like, "What does dipped in butter mean?" And then Wait, that's what <laughs> you got. You got to tell them about the other one. Polish my rack. Well, polish my rack is also um, we have that on some of our stuff too, and right. we have it uh, on some of our shirts and stuff. And really, what it meant was when I was a sergeant, a lot of detectives would come to you and try to talk to you condescendingly. 
Like, hey, Sarge, you never did this. You never did that. And I would say, go get your gun cloth and your gun oil and go polish my rack. You know, my medals, my rack of medals. Right, so right. now that we make these shirts, women are like, oh, I can't really wear that, wear that in public, polish my rack, because right, it's, it has, right a different, the front. Yeah, it has yeah. a different meaning altogether, you know? <laughs> Chaz, when you first started out, I know you started out in the actor's studio. Was that with Lee Strasberg? I first started out, no. First, I started at working at the Lee Strasberg Institute. That wasn't with Lee. Then, after years went on, I studied, I, I went into the actor's studio, and still, you don't get a chance to study with Lee until you got to study with some of the other guys. I studied with uh, uh, Ernie Martin, and then I got invited into Lee's class, finally. And now I'm what, a member of that. Was, was that on Irving Place, the actor's studio? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, it was. Yeah, you know, I used to ten. I used to ten bar at Pete's Tavern in in the yeah. uh, early eighties. Yeah. yeah, on eight. Yeah, because yeah, a lot was, of the students from Strasburg School yeah, would come in. There. You know, Bill has got a. He wears a lot of hats. He's a retired NYPD sergeant from the Homicide Squad, but he's also a college professor. He's a stand-up comedian. Him and I met on a show called The Perfect Murder back in 2016. We were uh, we had a friend of ours, Ricky Torelli, that was uh, executive producer of the show. And I never met Bill. You know, we were on the same job, but we never met. And uh, they had us come down. He had already did the show a few times. And uh, so I get there a little nervous, never acted before. I thought it was a joke that he was asking me to act. I, he was serious. Anyways, <laughs> I meet Billy, and he's like, yeah, don't worry about it. Just do what we normally do. Next thing you know... Uh, we went through the, the, that episode, and I did a couple more episodes, and it was, it was a lot of fun. But Billy's uh, he's got a lot of talents. I dabbled a little bit in acting. I took, like, classes for, like, three years. But I, I never really got, you know, to the next level. Well, but, uh, cops are natural actors, man. Yeah. Natural. <laughs> it's funny yeah. because yourself, that's all. I did three episodes of The Perfect Murder. And the last day of shooting on the last one I did, we must have did 15, 20 scenes. And, it, you know, it was really difficult. At, when we got to like the, almost to the end, I had a cheat sheet on the desk. We were doing an interview in a, in a, a squad office, and in one of the shots, the it was a very small room. The camera goes, "No, no, you got to you got to get rid of that." Uh, we could see it. I said, "Okay," I threw it on the floor. I said, "I'm done." So the director goes, "What do you mean?" I says. I went through all these scenes. I can't, I can't remember this no more. He goes, you know what? Don't worry about it. He tells the actor. He goes, you got it? The kid goes, yeah. The guy was playing my punt. He goes, you got it? Yeah. So now I start really, you know, I take the, the guy was supposedly killed his girlfriend. I take the picture. I stick it in his face. He knocks the picture out of my hand. Cut. The actor goes, well, the director goes, that was great. That was great. So we just went on like that ad lib and we threw, threw away the script and it turned out to be great, you know? But it's not a newfound respect for actors. It's not easy. It's difficult. Yeah. Even one or two sentences is difficult. So yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, we got like 70, 80 pages of dialogue. It's hard when you do a play, like a play. When I do my one man show, I have uh, it's ninety pages of dialogue by myself. Wow, you know, it's, it's a it's a run. I didn't know that the one man show became before the movie. Yeah. I thought yeah. it was the other way around. No, and that's, no, that's no. An, that's an unbelievable story. You want to you want to tell a little bit about about that story? Yeah. Well, what happened was I was uh you know it's one of those stories that a lot of people know, but I'll I'll kind of condense it a little bit for you. But I'll tell you, uh, what happened was I was in uh, L.A. and as soon as I, I went to L.A. in 1986, I went to L.A. in 1986 and I got on. I started hitting it. I got on uh, Hill Street Blues. If you remember that show. Yeah. And, uh, and and Madlock with a, 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 another show called Dallas. So I was banging like a lot of guest star roles, and I was able to save some money. But as any act that happens, you know, you start running out of money. I used that money to last for about a couple of years. Then I started running out of money again. So then I got a job as a doorman because I used to bounce, you know, in New York at, at certain clubs. And uh, I got a job at this really swanky place, and it was great. You know, I started supplement my income with that auditioning. And then one night I was out there and there was a very big party, a fancy party. And this one guy come walking over to me and he grabbed the rope and he yelled at me, I'm, I'm late for my party, let me in. And he was really abusive to me. And I said, I'm sorry, you just got to give me your name first. And he said, do you know who I am? So now when a guy says that to me, when a person says, do you know who I am? That tells me that you're an asshole right away. Yeah, hundred percent. You know how many times as cops we've heard that shit? I'm sure. <laughs> cops hear that all the time. So when he said that to me, I said, yeah, I know who you are. You're not, you're the guy who's not getting in tonight. 
So that <laughs> really pissed him off. So he said, you're going to be fired in 15 minutes. So he uh, he started making a big fuss. The only came out, and who was the guy? It was Swifty Lazar. Now, Swifty Lazar was the biggest agent in the world at the time. And just like he said, I got fired in 15 minutes, just like he said. And I, I went home. <laughs> I said, what the hell am I going to do? I had no money, but... I sat down and I said, you know what? I looked on the, on the refrigerator. I had this car that my father gave me when I was a, a very young man. And it said, the saddest thing in life is wasted talent. And I said, you know what? I'm not going to waste my life. If they won't give me a great part, I'll write one myself. I went to Thrifty Drugstore. I got five tabs of yellow paper, just like this, because I make my notes with this. And I came back and I said, what am I going to write about? And I started writing about this relationship I had with this wise guy and the killing that I saw when I was nine years old, almost 10 I was. And I saw each week, each day, each week I would write, and each week I would perform 10 minutes, five minutes, keep five, edit, edit, workshop it. And at the end of a year, I had 90 minutes of a one-man show that I did. This whole story, they called The Bronx Tale. I performed it, and bam, it was like insane. I was like, I won all these awards. The reviews were insane. And then about a month into it, I got a call from a studio. And he said, listen, you know, they want to offer me $250,000 for my story. Now, I, I had only $200 in the bank at the time. <laughs> and $250,000 was a lot of money. But I said, you know, but I want to play Sonny and I want to write the screenplay. And they said, no, you, you know, you're a wonderful actor, but nobody knows you. You can't do it. So I said, well, then forget it. They said, you're going to walk away from this? I said, yeah. So I started doing the show again. About a month later, another studio came in and offered me 500000 I said, can I play Sonny? Can I write the screenplay? Again, they said, no. Same thing. I went back to doing it. Everybody came to see it. Pacino came. Nicholson came. Ray Sharkey came. Burt Reynolds came. Every studio head came. Every big producer came. Every big director came to see it. Everybody wanted it. The last time it was like this was the best is alone. So 20 years later, it happened with me. So finally, I said no again to the 500. And then finally, I, I did the show one night, and I got off stage, and, and the stage manager walked over to me and said, hey, Robert De Niro is in your dressing room. He just snuck in there after the show. He's waiting for you. I said, Robert De Niro? He goes, yeah. I said, okay. I, I walked in, and there was Bob sitting there. And, he said to me, he said, that's the greatest one-man show I ever saw. He goes, you did a movie on stage. And I said, yeah, Bob, I, 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 I know. And he said, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. He goes, you should play, Sonny. You'll be great, Sonny. You should write it because it's your life. And he goes, I'll play your father. I'll direct it. And if you shake my hand, that's the way it's going to be. I shook his hand, and that's what happened. Growing up, I was, I was born in 60. And the French Connection come out about 72. And I snuck into a movie theater with my friends, probably 73. We had to sneak into the theater because we weren't old enough. And I saw that movie. And from that minute on, I always wanted to be a cop. It really influenced me. It was filmed right in my neighborhood in Brooklyn, not far from where I was today by Spumoni Gardens. There was a, the whole car chase scene was all through uh, that area. And between my uncle being a cop when I was a kid, let me, you know, dry fire his gun and stuff. And, and that movie, it was it for me. All I wanted to do was become a detective. And when you put your mind to something, you, you can really do it, you know. And uh, it yeah. just all worked out for me, you know. I, I was always curious, what does it take for a regular cop? Do you have to take a test to be a detective or, or it's really done on college? It, it, it's it's done on merit, but there's, there's hooks too. Guys get into the detective bureau uh, from merit, you know, you go into plain clothes first, anti-crime, or you go into narcotics, and then you might go into robbery, and then you go into the detective bureau. There's three, uh, there's three grades of detective in the NYPD. When you first get promoted, you're third grade detective, then you're second grade detective. I retired as a second grader, and then there's first grade. And um, you know, it, it to me, it, there's no better thing that I could have done with my life than become a detective. I'm very proud of that shield behind me, and we have a moniker that says. We're the greatest detectives in the world, and I really believe that. Uh, I don't think there was any case that the NYPD couldn't solve. You know, uh, we really there was some just tremendous. Ta in my time on the job, I worked on a lot of high-profile cases, and uh, the talent that just 
you know, shine through from the from the old timers as well as the new guys. Uh, oh. It was really great. I, I was taught by some really great old timers. There's just so did many. You know, did you know Detective Calandra? Uh, I I knew a Paulie. I'm actually distantly related to a Paulie Calandra. No, he was the chief. He was the chief of detectives, Chief Calandra. Oh, oh yeah. Um, I don't know if oh, Colangelo. 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 Yeah. Colangelo. Yeah. 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 No, I, I, I remember that. that guy. Yeah. yeah. He, he actually yeah. lived in Westchester. Yeah. yeah. I think yeah. he lived in Arsenal. Yeah. yeah. He was a tough guy. Yeah. He was a tough guy. Yeah. A, a yeah, no, I, I remember him. You just Calandra, Cal Calandra is one of the um the guy we, one of the, one of the white Calandra guys, is one of the uh yeah. Avenue yeah. U boys, right? Yeah. <laughs> the Bat yeah. Avenue crew. Bat yeah. Avenue yeah. crew, yeah. But Chief, uh, Cal Chief Calangelo had a funny way about him. There was a, a, a female cop shot a guy, and the guy was in the hospital. He wasn't doing too good, and he wound up dying. But before he died, he came over to me and my partner because we were the first ones, and he put his arm around. He goes, come on, boys. Tell me what happened over here. You know, he was just like uh, he was like a regular guy, you know? Right, right. Yeah, no, did, did you, I, know, you know him, Chaz? No, I, I, Sandy Blue Eyes was his personal driver, so Sandy – Told okay. Me some great stories about him. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, and Bobby, my the other cop, he was in the TPF in the sixties. Oh, that's the real, uh, the real, the real heavy hitters. Yeah. Wow, yeah. yeah. I grew up in Gravesend, Sammy's neighborhood, generally. Yeah. And I saw a lot of different things over the years. I saw a lot of wise guys and some wise guys were just, they were, they had the reputation, but then there were some real wise guys, old school wise guys. Like when I retired and I started hanging around in, in Spumoni Gardens, there was a retired wise guy there, Xbox. I, I became really close with the guy and the guy had heart. And what I mean by that is this, he did what he did. He was into, he wasn't a killer or anything like that, gambling or whatever, but he was retired. And one night we were getting ready to leave the place and he left ahead of us and he saw a car outside that he thought they were going to hold the place up. He went around the block and he went to come back in and his name was Angelo. I says, Ange, what are you doing? He goes, I ain't leaving. I said, what do you mean? He goes, that car over there, I don't like the way they look. He goes, uh, I'm not leaving until they leave. I'll leave with you guys. So a guy that, you know, he barely knew me a short time. He wouldn't leave because he thought I was going to, you know, we were going to get held up in the place. So that's guys with heart, old school now. He yeah, did what he did. Know. He had his life, yeah. but you know. But I Sammy always says the expression, He's a real tough guy, both with his hands and with a gun. Right. <laughs> you know what? It's right to say that because some guys are, are tough with a gun, but they're not tough with a hand. My uncle, I call him my uncle, but he really wasn't my uncle, but he was like my uncle. And he was a, a his name is Mantro, Joey Mantro. And uh, he was a boxer. And this guy, i never seen anybody do this. We were in a place once, and the crowd was like all around us. And it was a God, it was the, fan, the Fantasy East. It was a nightclub back then. And all of a sudden, this kid pulled out a gun. And he's waving it around. He's cursing at this other guy that he's going to shoot. And this guy, Mepro, it was his. He had a piece of this joint. You know, he didn't want to kill him in the joint, right? And the guy just, he's waving the gun like this. And my uncle walks over. And he says, put the gun down. He says, he goes, you can't make me put down. And walks straight over to him, grabs a gun, and slaps him. I mean... <laughs> But I mean, straight at him. Like, didn't yeah. even phase him with the gun. Just grab the gun and smack him. And I don't forget that. I just looked at everybody. We all looked at each other and said, whoa. You know what I mean? I mean, I, I, this is the tough guy, man. This that's a tough, a tough guy. That's right. That's, yeah, that's that's what Sammy the Bull would describe as a tough guy. For that's sure. a tough guy. When we interviewed Sammy, the last question I asked him, I said, Sammy, one question. Young guys growing up in the neighborhood today – looking up to gangsters, mobsters, what do you have to say to them? What advice do you have to give to them? He said, you want to know my advice is? He goes, go fuck yourself. In plain English, he goes, I got <laughs> shot at. I almost got killed numerous right. times. I had all these problems. He goes, you want it? God bless you. Go get it. He goes, but if I could tell you one thing, go F yourself, he says. And and so he 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 showed me that, you know, he wanted to give out a little advice to young guys that are maybe uh, caught up in the, uh, you know, the fancy cars, like you said, the women, yeah. the money, the fancy clothes, so. You know, look, it's it, it's not a good life. It's not it's not the Godfather. You know, you watch these movies like The Godfather, and you say, "Wow, you know, this is romanticized." And it's not the Godfather. It, it's it's horrible lives. That most of them have horrible marriages. Their children, God knows what they're doing. You know, it's not a good life. I'm sorry, it's really not. You know, but 
sometimes because of the movies, you look at it and you go, oh, you know, uh, gee, that's really great. What? You want to be made? What, what do you want to be made for? You want to be divorced? That puts it, you put a target on your back when you're that's, that's 100%. 100%. You know, what I'm saying? you know, I remember years ago, you guys are, are old enough to know. You remember Nicky Buns, the, the drug dealer? Yeah, yeah. Yep. As soon as I seen him on the cover of Time magazine, I looked at my father and I said, he's done. He's done. Yeah. And, and months later, boom, he was caught. Yeah. You, know, yeah. you, you can't beat the government. So yeah, I got to go to my restaurants. I got two restaurants, one in the city, Charles Palmateri, one of the best Italian restaurants in the, in the city, 30 West 46th Street. And I, I just opened a new one in White Plains right here. You know, That's close to me. I, that's the one I'm going to go to. Yes, 264 Main Street. Forget Absolutely. It, Italian food around. I came to your restaurant when it was on uh, first or second, I think second Avenue. Second Avenue. You, yeah, yeah, I came there. We met you that night. I was with all my cousins from Spaloni yeah. Gardens, and we met you that night. That was about uh, probably about five or six years ago, I yeah. guess. Yeah. Well, I got to tell you, I started out this day in Brooklyn at L&B Spumoni Gardens. I got to meet your lovely daughter and your lovely wife, and I got to meet you. And yeah, there's the picture. It was That's great, great. Uh, reminiscent talking. Uh, I'm very honored. Uh, thankful to have had this time with you, Chaz, and uh, hope to see you again. We're definitely going to come out to your restaurant, restaurant for sure. Absolutely, and, uh, Folks, thank you so much for listening tonight, and we really uh, want to thank Chaz Palminteri, great actor, great human being. Thanks for coming on the show, Chaz. God bless. Thank you. Thank you for your service. Thank you. One episode, just saying enough.